I take a breath every day. Just a breath. Just, what am I going to do today? What's going to help me today? Who's going to help me today? Who's going to make me feel like a piece of shit? I need a place. I need to stop being stressed. I wish I wasn't homeless. You know, there's sort of a stereotype that they've got to all just be bad kids. You have to remind them that inside they're really just a broken child. Tonight I don't know where I'm sleeping, so I go moment to moment on a daily basis. Grab a blanket and go sleep underneath the bridge or something. Every day I try to get something done towards making my life better. It just seems like it's difficult because every time I'm moving a step forward, every time it just wants to knock me three steps back. I wish the public would realize that it's not fun. This is not fun to be homeless. Um, my name's Cassidy McLaren and currently I'm not homeless, but I have been before. I was, when I first moved up here, I came from Missouri. Um, it was in January of 2012. And um, my brother had told us that when we came up here, he had a house and everything for us and he didn't. He ended up leaving me, my mom, and my sister in Veterans Park in the middle of January. Down there we get two inches of snow and they close everything for like a week and a half, you know what I'm saying? So to come up here where there being like three feet of snow, we didn't know what to do. The first night I had come down here, we had to walk from New Horizons all the way to the police department in the snow with our luggage. We walked past a couple houses with the lights on and I started crying. I'm like, Mom, why can't we have a home? Why did, why did my brother do this to us? When I was growing up, I had 18 brain surgeries on my head. A lot of days, like, I'd be getting a wicked bad headache. My Nana Mary Lou would have to rush me all the way up to the hospital, but I have not been doing that on a regular basis because of, uh, there's nobody to bring me up there. My grandmother was the one that was my mother figure to me. Uh, but she's not around anymore. Like all that disintegrated and I had to move to Manchester to be homeless because my father started using drugs. Apparently, shit goes how it goes. Awareness is the first step. And once people are aware that there is a problem of youth homelessness, um, then I think that motivates us to then take some action. Mm -hmm. And part of that action may be very simple and may be that you're just aware of that and you, you live your life that way. And so when you see someone on the street, um, you treat them respectfully or you um, at least acknowledge that they're there. Um, some of our youth come in and say that they feel like they're invisible and that even when they're on the street nobody will look at them or they you know may say a, a nasty comment as they walk by and so I would hope that people can understand that these youth um, are not here by choice generally they're here because um, there's been family upset whether that's through um, mental illness or substance abuse or um, They've been in the foster care system or the juvenile justice system and they don't have a place to go when they leave that system. I was cou mostly couch surfing and I was sleeping in a car. I think finding somewhere to park was the hardest part. I wouldn't try and go like in a parking lot with like the only car there. I didn't want to like make myself stick out. So I kind of just blended in on some side streets. I moved from Concord to Manchester in the, the, my sophomore year, so my teachers had no idea that I was homeless. I really do think the numbers on homelessness is wrong, because there, there are a lot of people who, who you would just never know. You just don't know. People would have never thought I was homeless until I started sharing it.
you can you see some of the people that are sitting on the side of the road so like alright they're like 30, 40 but you don't see the teenagers walking on the streets holding everything because most teenagers walk down the streets holding backpacks no matter what We are known as the Youth Resource Center, formally, but if you ask a kid on the street of Manchester, we are known as the 404. For us, it's like our code word, basically, like our own secret place name. Where if we're out in public and we're talking about the 404, everybody else around us has no idea what we're talking about. You know, in the land of the internet, 404 means not found. And when you're a homeless youth, being not found is a profound statement because they don't want to be found and yet they need to be found. So in this bag we usually bring with us, we have um, hand warmers, socks, uh, cleaning kits, and then we pack a lot of snacks, we have soap. So we're about to do some outreaching um, and talk to people who might be at the site, see if they might know any youth in the area who are in need of basic needs services and just kind of to get our voice out in the community to tell about what we do. I know that there is a tenting ban, but a tent offers a lot more shelter than just a bench and a dugout. A tent could be, is the difference between life and death sometimes. It gets really cold in New Hampshire, <laughs> like really cold. I spend a lot of time sleeping in some of the dugouts at the baseball fields. I have slept in parking garages. Most nights I've actually just, I've gone weeks without sleep and just walking around the city because I couldn't find a spot to sleep. A lot of those nights, I would dream and hope that I just, that I wouldn't wake up so I didn't have to suffer another night in the cold that I could be warm, finally. There are many different types of ordinances and or state laws that are adopted that essentially make the status of, of being homeless uh, criminalized. And when these ordinances are adopted on a city level, really what it is about is trying to drive these populations out of a, a, a particular city. Uh, city after city, uh, town after town adopts these ordinances. Uh, it's as if these people have no place else to go. There's money in our state budget that goes to emergency shelters uh, and those that's sort of the adult and family shelter system that happens throughout our state. Um, we don't have a youth shelter system and we don't have a line item in the budget that's specifically geared towards young people. And we had gone to New Horizons to eat dinner and then we were going to stay at the shelter but we couldn't because I wasn't above age because it is a wet shelter. You know there's an adult shelter for 18 year olds and over but the truth is that it's really not like an ideal setting for somebody that's that young. You know it really exposes them to people that are in, in a chronic homeless lifestyle and our kind of mentality here at the Youth Resource Center is to try to catch people and talk to people before they get to that point. There's a lot of people there that are in active addiction and I knew that me being there could be more harmful, harmful to my health than me being outside in the cold. Because if it wasn't the cold that was going to kill me, it was going to be a relapse. I hate being a female out on these streets because it's like they always expect something out of a female. I get help from people, but they always expect something out of me. And it's like, that's not helping. That's not kindness. It's not at all. What would you expect with a heart so tender? Well, the nation's greatness is measured by how it treats its weakest. I think that's really important to keep in mind. This is not a case of encouraging people 
to pull themselves up by their bootstraps or to be self-reliant. These are children. Uh, there's plenty of time for self-reliance when they've achieved adulthood, properly prepared. What we need to do is take care of our children. We have that obligation to our own children and for those children whose parents have not been able to fulfill that obligation, I believe that we have to step in and, and help with those children as well. And if we don't help them now, it's, it won't get any better. Well, it'll be our problem later on. Right. Clay, how do, these, how do we teach these kids to go out, get a job, get an education, and deal with their trauma, and get clean and sober, and, and do all the things that society expects them to do if they don't know where they're gonna sleep at night. But that's the expectation that we're, these kids are being asked to get their shit together. <laughs> well, they can't get their shit together if they don't have a place to get it together. As research, I think, has indicated, if you get people in stable housing first, it makes it more likely that they're going to be able to successfully utilize the other types of resources that might be available. This is about how do we end youth homelessness, and I think it's important to understand that funding from the federal government and from the state needs to come to those avenues that are working out there for the kids. This should be about children. This shouldn't be about anything else that anybody wants to project about a political view or anything else. It should be about how do we end homelessness for children. I started coming in to CFS um, back in 2014. Um, I was homeless back then and they really helped me get on my feet when they told me that I had an opportunity to go to the Transitional Living Program and it was honestly like the best thing I've ever done. It really gives youth a place to, to settle. We find that that first 30 days, they whew, take a deep breath and they say, oh, I'm okay. Um, I have a place to stay tonight. I know where I'm gonna sleep tonight. I have food in the kitchen. I have a kitchen that, a shower that I can go to every day. Like these girls became a part of my life. Like we would do everything together, whether, you know, we all worked and we were all working towards the same things and the same goals. But when we had that downtime and everybody was home, we would take that time and just hang out with each other. You know, we had Thanksgiving dinners, Christmas dinners, like the whole nine. If it was, someone was graduating, we'd celebrate there. And it was like one big happy family, you know? And it's something that I wasn't, I haven't felt in so long. Like for instance, on Christmas, we woke up and we had presents under the tree, you know? And I don't know the last time I had a Christmas where I actually woke up with presents under the tree. majority of our young people have experienced extreme trauma throughout most of their life. You know, you think about um, acute trauma where you can kind of define my life before the incident, my life after the incident, so like a severe car accident or something like that. You know, our kids, acute trauma makes no sense to them because their life is full of complex trauma where they were born into families that have unhealthy relationships and violence and sexual abuse and neglect and so all of those things on top of one another. I mean by the time they're 15, 16, 17 years old, they're struggling just to figure out how to keep themselves safe and how to survive day to day. It all started when I was 17. My mom um, started using heroin. So kind of just went downhill from there. Um, it wasn't until both of my parents got incarcerated at the same time, um, which left me and my sister alone. It was just a revolving door of drugs when I was growing up. Uh, right now with the opiate epidemic that we have here in the city, a lot of these students and children have parents that may be addicts uh, and need to find a way to get away from that uh, so that they can, again, be productive members of our community. Everybody's doing drugs these days. Heroin is not heroin anymore, it's fentanyl. I know a lot of people who have died from it. And it's crazy. 
if you have the willpower to say no, then stick to it. I used to be really addicted to drugs, you know what I'm saying? And once, like, I come here all the time, and, like, they help me not want to use. My father left when I was very little. And my mother and my stepfather have never truly ever been around. And even in my teenage years, they were never around while I was growing up, which is why I think I started lashing out and just started using drugs to cope with the fact that they weren't there. Do we need a much better understanding of trauma and the way that trauma affects youth? What trauma does to people and what it does to you physically, to your brain, to your, um, to your whole body. Um, I really believe that that's crucial to being able to support people. I see that as so central, like I don't see that as a side issue. So I, I work with a number of people who are trans or gender non-conforming, who have experienced homelessness or who are currently homeless. Uh, so many LGBTQ youth we see uh, who are marginally housed, maybe couch surfing with friends, um, or who are homeless and relying on shelters or, or sleeping on the street, um, all have this very uh, similar narrative of trauma and violence in their life. I have tried to talk to my mother and stepfather about being transgender and I w they basically laughed in my face and told me that there must be something wrong in my head which is around the time that I just packed up my bag and just left home. We know that um, individuals who are transgender uh, suffer homelessness at much, much, much higher rates than the general population. So here in New Hampshire, uh, according to the la latest National Transgender Survey, about 10% uh, of people, uh, transgender people who were surveyed, said that they had experienced homelessness uh, within the past year. In my tenure here at Child and Family Services, we've had three, trans, four transgender youth come through our transitional living program. And for some of them, for probably all of them, this has been a place that they can be accepted for who they want to be and who they're trying to be um, and feel pretty safe. The opportunities that they've been given or not given, you know, and, and I think it's such a shame that a lot of the youth do feel like it's their own fault. There's just a lot of shame, I think, that goes into that. I, I, I can't I can't read as much as I want to. Like, I'll get stuck on big, big words, and I just avoid it. I avoid trying to read it when I was younger. Nobody wanted to help me read it. My mom and dad were there, but never there. So things that many of us have learned through having positive role models in our life, like conflict resolution and problem solving and um, just really how do you get along with other people in an environment where there may be times when you don't see eye to eye with them um, and what does it mean to follow the rules and have an authority figure and even just things like showing up on time so you know some people will say there's job readiness programs in this community but not job readiness programs that are paying them and providing them that sort of employment mentorship that they need to be successful because they haven't ever been in a place for many of them where they've had role models you know seeing somebody in a successful career is something they see on tv how can i fill out an application if i can't read it it took me two hours to fill out a job application on the computer i'm really really hoping i do get a job and i'm really hoping i can do it I'm just nervous because like what if I get a well, like what if I get a position where I can't do it and I just what if I don't do the right thing and When I was younger my dad used to always beat me a big reason why we left Missouri is to get away from him like I don't spank my son like I don't physically punish him Precious life, my precious son. To me, he could grow up 
being like an angry kid because like I was very angry growing up always because my dad used to always hit me and stuff. I used to always get into fights over the stupidest things. I'm and I just don't want him to be an angry little boy. Not even thinking of how you cry for me. You know, so many things have an effect on what their futures look like. You know, our job is to help them to be exposed to the options and help them to believe that whatever the option is that they really want to pick, that it's possible for them. I want to go to college for forensic science, eventually be a scientist. And I would learn with my daughter. I would learn what my daughter, my daughter would teach me. So what did you learn at school today that I don't know? Teach me, teach me something. I understand, yeah, they had a bad past, but why don't you help them make a better future? All of us come from different backgrounds. We all have our own backstory. It's, we've all learned, it's what we do in the future that truly matters at this point. It took me a long time to realize what happiness was. Because for so long I wasn't happy with myself, I wasn't happy with what was going on around me, I wasn't happy with the people I was associating with, and I'm starting to be more kind and gentle to people. I'm learning every day, I'm learning. You know, we, we wouldn't be able to do this work every day if we didn't believe that there's a possibility of success for all of them. I, on a given day, it could be, it could be crazy, you know. We got kids having kids, and you got the little ones, you know, and I call them the littles running through here laughing like they don't have a care in the world and they're happy and they're safe and that just makes your heart like overflow because you know that they're safe and we get to lay eyes on the littles knowing that they're okay and then you got their moms who you know are struggling and they're okay but they're not and you're looking for a place to help and find a place to live and you know that it doesn't exist. So what do you do? You give them a hot pocket and a place to take a shower and you get them some clean clothes and you say, what can I do for you? And then at six o'clock you lock the door and you say a prayer and you say, oh, see you tomorrow. And you wonder. And then you come back to tomorrow and you start it all over again. Yes, and sometimes with the wrong keys, the doors are locked up. Sometimes with the wrong keys, the doors are locked up. Sometimes with the wrong keys, the doors are locked. I keep ringing your tears. I knew how to touch you without making it